Um, so I'm going to be speaking today about um, proportionality in uh, counterterrorism, and um, uh, by proportionality is going to be meant the usual legal understanding of proportionality, as opposed to uh, uh, perhaps a more inclusive, more flexible philosophical uh, concept of uh, proportionality or proportionateness. Um, and in general, um, I'm uh, inclined to favor the more flexible uh, philosophical um, one to the legal concept. And I'm going to uh, begin uh, just with a rough definition of what counterterrorism uh, is. I'll take counterterrorism to mean uh, state sponsored measures to prevent attacks by extremist groups on ordinary citizens. And um, I have in mind particularly uh, police measures, which I'll come to in a, in a moment, but also uh, civil society campaigns. And these, these uh, could be campaigns um, typically within uh, Western uh, liberal democracies um, uh, aimed at the general citizenry to sensitize them to uh, the uh, risks of terrorism, but also to promote um, anti-terrorist values, say, a democratic, uh, peaceful protest um, within a, 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 a given citizenry, uh, and sometimes within a, an ethnic community that is stereotyped um, as being a, a possible source of um, uh, terrorist sympathizing uh, people. Um, these civil society campaigns uh, are often objectionable in various ways, but um, one thing about them is that they're not police measures. They're preventive, but they're not police measures. And uh, they're, they're very familiar throughout Western Europe. Uh, it, and in Britain, um, they've been tried uh, for quite a long time. Um, so that's uh, the state-sponsored measures to prevent attacks. Uh, there are also uh, uh, state measures to prosecute those who are responsible for terrorist attacks. And we'll see that the issues raised by state preventive measures, especially when they're police measures, um, are different from the issues raised by prosecution, uh, identification and prosecution of people uh, who are responsible for terrorist attacks that have actually occurred. So uh, just to make these, uh, these issues uh, explicit, in reactive counterterrorism, that's to say, the kind of counterterrorism that uh, seeks to identify the perpetrators of acts that have already occurred. In the case of reactive counterterrorism, there are sometimes uh, due process issues. Um, so uh, there are issues to do with whether people who are accused of terrorist offenses can get fair trials. Uh, there are also issues to do with deportation, whether people convicted of uh, terrorist offenses uh, can be deported and. Uh, whether in particular they can be deported to countries that practice torture. That's an issue that's particularly um, live in, uh, in Britain. Uh, then there are issues uh, to do with discrimination. That's to say whether when uh, a terrorist a, a, a act has been uh, committed, uh, the suspicion falls primarily on members of a stereotyped ethnic group or um, other people who are wrongly perhaps and not on the basis of evidence associated with uh, terrorist activity. So the discriminatory risks of counterterrorism, I think are fairly well known and they'll come up again in Kat's talk on uh, profiling. Uh, finally there are a set of issues to do with uh, reactive counterterrorism and privacy. Um, uh, because lots of surveillance measures are used um, uh, in order to identify suspects. Um, CCTV uh, footage is used, uh, other kinds of surveillance um, uh, measures are used, and those often uh, are quite indiscriminate and uh, may identify people who are perfectly innocent, have nothing to do uh, with the terrorist offense, so it may be the case that their privacy is violated even when no terrorist suspects are identified. Those then are the issues to do with reactive counterterrorism. 
Uh, in the case of preventive counterterrorism, that's to say where one wants to keep the terrorist act from actually occurring, the issues are even larger and uh, more uh, worrying. So in preventive counterterrorism, there's uh, quite a big area of controversy to do with uh, the idea that count preventive counterterrorism aims at precognition of crimes. That is, that it, it aims to identify perpetrators before any act has been committed, any terrorist act has been committed, and it also criminalizes uh, steps that might lead to the commission of a terrorist act when those steps by themselves wouldn't previously um, have been illegal but are only made illegal by special uh, ad hoc uh, counter-terrorist legislation. So I'll come back to precognition. Uh, then there are special investigative techniques. These are uh, techniques for which the police need special permission and which involve um, otherwise objectionable methods of identifying uh, possible perpetrators of terrorist acts. And then again, in, in the case of preventive counterterrorism, there are likely to be privacy violations, especially if there's surveillance of private places um, or if there is uh, uh, logging of uh, telephone calls on mobile phones or other kinds of, of, of tracking of people. Uh, these all um, uh, carry risks of violations of privacy. Now, um, uh, when we consider proportionality in the legal sense, a lot uh, depends uh, in the definition of proportionality on there being a legitimate goal that is or isn't pursued proportionately. And um, so we need to specify, though I'm not doing it very precisely, the goal of counterterrorism. And um, not all of these bullet points are uncontroversial. The more controversial ones, I've got a question mark next to. So uh, to, to start with the um, with the first bullet points, which are less uh, controversial, one goal of counterterrorism is the prevention of terrorist attacks. And another goal of counterterrorism is the successful prosecution of perpetrators of unsuccessful attacks and successful attacks. Uh, so, um, those are two of the less controversial goals of counterterrorism. Uh, here are some others. Um, uh, it might be a goal of counterterrorism to make it socially unacceptable publicly to applaud terrorism. Um, that might be one of the objectives of these civil society campaigns I've mentioned earlier. It might also be um, uh, it might be also socially unacceptable if these campaigns work for people openly to recruit um, possible uh, uh, supporters of uh, terrorist groups. Let's say to recruit these people openly or to recruit them by leafleting them. Um, at, at uh, various uh, public places. Um, another thing uh, that, uh, that might be made um, unacceptable is um, uh, certain kinds of internet activity, um, certain kinds of, of activity uh, especially, not only that applaud terrorism, but that seem, uh, seem to be um, uh, gathering funds for it. All of these might be uh, possible goals of counterterrorism to discourage uh, fundraising uh, for these groups, as well as public applause for terrorist acts, and so on. So this is these are the, the, the goals of counterterrorism we might have in mind. Now, proportionality uh, contains some tests. The uh, legal idea of proportionality is meant to constrain the means that are used. Uh, to pursue the worthwhile end, assuming it is a worthwhile end, of counterterrorism. Presumably, uh, counterterrorism is worthwhile because it's, it aims at saving life and uh, that it aims at promoting democratic as opposed to violent means of uh, making a point. Um, so let's suppose that uh, counterterrorism, uh, in at least its uncontroversial aspects, the, the, the bullet points I had on the previous slide, let's suppose that it's a worthwhile end. 
And then proportionality is to do with the means adopted to pursue that end. So the means have to be necessary. Um, it, it means that the means, um, if the means aren't followed, there won't be um, uh, a successful pursuit of the goal. That's what necessity means. Um, also, the means have to be effective. By uh, adopting the means, one um, is supposed to have a reasonable chance of succeeding um, in achieving the goal. And then, where there are several means to choose from, um, the least bad or the least intrusive or the least uh, human rights violating is the one to be preferred. That's the general rough understanding of proportionality. This least bad condition is sometimes known as the subsidiarity condition of proportionality. Well, um, one way that we can apply the concept of proportionality is to certain kinds of legislative acts themselves. Um, uh, since 9-11, um, uh, um, a lot of laws have been introduced, particularly in uh, England and Wales, um, to criminalize not only terrorist acts, which were, are, were already criminal, but to criminalize various uh, steps that people might take to um, prepare uh, uh, terrorism. And uh, there has been a, a, a very interesting criticism of uh, the tendency to criminalize attempts uh, by Heidi Lomel, uh, a Norwegian um, lawyer, uh, who, who makes a number of interesting uh, suggestions. Um, she uh, objects to um, uh, prevention, uh, the prevention of harm, as uh, one of the, the uh, main uh, goals of justice. She, she thinks that the prevention of harm, as opposed to doing justice, um, she thinks that the prevention of harm belongs to a, a paradigm, as she calls it, that is uh, quite uh, different from the traditional uh, justice uh, paradigm. Um, and uh, uh, we'll come to the, this difference between a security paradigm and a justice paradigm in a moment. But she's particularly concerned with a range of offenses. These are offenses that consist of taking steps likely to lead uh, to the commission of a um, criminal act. And some of these are called inchoate offenses. Um, these are acts that are not harmful in themselves but lead to harm. And examples of these are possession, possession, say, of dangerous weapons or possession of, of drugs uh, that might be uh, used to sell drugs. Um, and conspiracy, conspiracy to, uh, to commit various kinds of crime. Uh, Heidi Lomel also takes the example of grooming in the case of child abuse. Grooming is a preparatory act, but it might not consist of anything that would normally be regarded as an evil in itself. But it is highlighted as a kind of preparatory act that should be criminalized because it so often leads uh, to, to greater abuse. And she's interested in the criminalization of preparations as opposed to the criminalization of attempts. So the, the crime of attempted murder is familiar in many jurisdictions and she doesn't seem to be objecting to the crime of attempted murder. But she thinks that the concept of preparation uh, is more vague. So um, a preparation is taking steps that might or might not uh, lead to the crime and an attempt is where those steps reach a point of no return. Anyway, we come now to, uh, to what her main uh, conceptual objection is, and her main conceptual objection is that um, uh, criminalizing preparation moves in the direction of something quite incoherent, which is punishing people for things they haven't yet done. She thinks that that's uh, uh, completely incoherent, and that it tries to bring um, uh, to make punishment in the form of uh, um, the criminal uh, costs in law of um, attempts and preparations and other inchoate offenses, it tries to bring punishment to bear before a crime has actually been, been committed. Um, and, and this is where she tries to give a diagnosis of 
what's wrong uh, with the precognition um, idea. And, and what she says is that um, uh, precognition of crime belongs to a security paradigm rather than a justice paradigm. And there are some differences that she claims there are between the security and the justice paradigm. Uh, security is partial in the sense of uh, not being impartial. And it's often geared to a friend-enemy distinction. Uh, it uses the precautionary principle, that's to say that harm that can be minimized in advance ought to be. And it's much more worried about false um, uh, negatives than false positives. In other words, it's much more worried about missing uh, murders and missing terrorist acts than it is um, about intervening sometimes with legal costs in cases where no act is being, uh, no uh, crime is, is being prepared. Um, justice, on the other hand, she thinks is likely to be retrospective. It's, li it's likely to be interested in reparation and it's likely to have norms of impartiality that the security paradigm doesn't have. Another thing she thinks is good about the justice paradigm is that it allows for changes of heart. And she gives some, uh, some examples in this paper of terrorists who have been on the point of uh, uh, exploding a bomb and have suddenly changed their minds. And she thinks this possibility of changing your mind is exactly what's excluded by the, um, the, the security paradigm and by the criminalization that goes with it. So, uh, her conclusion is, is uh, that uh, the criminalization of um, preparation is disproportionate um, and it's not the least bad means of preventing counterterrorism. So, if one has a choice between legal regimes that don't criminalize preparations and legal regimes that do, um, we should not criminalize preparations. I think that is her, her main conclusion, that there's something disproportionate about laws that criminalize preparation. Now, I myself think that the, the opposition between the security paradigm and the justice paradigm is um, very questionable because it's clear that many laws are intended to prevent harm. It's clear that um, um, lots of legislation is precisely concerned um, uh, with security and that um, uh, there isn't a, uh, a preoccupation with security as opposed to law. There is a preoccupation with security that's incorporated uh, in law. So um, it, it, it's not obvious that uh, her approach is, um, is correct. And uh, in discussion with her, um, um, it, it was also not clear what her objection to um, punishing attempted murder was um, as opposed to murder and what her objection was given that the penalties for attempted murder were so much less than the penalties for murder there seemed to be a, um, um, both a reason for thinking that some at uh, attempts uh, on her view were legitimate and also a reason for thinking that by punishing attempts much, much less severely, um, this system of punishment was being proportionate. So uh, I don't think that the, the line of thought um, is, is uh, entirely um, well worked out, though one sees what she's uh, talking about. Now, the, 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 the next uh, uh, subject of proportionality that I want to discuss is um, connected with so-called special investigative techniques. Um, these are techniques um, that are, are um, used with official permission, but the permission has to be applied for by the police in uh, prosecuting serious crime and in trying to prevent a serious crime. And the main kinds of special uh, investigative techniques uh, that um, we're interested in are infiltration involving deception and intrusion, and perhaps um, uh, this very um, uh, murky area of entrapment where as part of infiltration one actually encourages the commission of a crime. This may or may not happen in some police operations but it's certainly a risk. And these are the risks that are associated with um, special investigative techniques.
that one actually encourages the commission of crime as opposed to collecting evidence about the intention uh, to commit the, the, the crime. And of course there are further issues to do with forming improper relationships uh, with uh, some of the, uh, the people who are, who are under investigation. In addition to infiltration, there's surveillance. That's, just, that's a special investigative technique, especially when the surveillance is of very private places like homes or hotel rooms, um, or involves wiretapping or what have you. These are special investigative techniques, and, and there are risks. And the, the, uh, uh, the, the question now is, um, can special investigative techniques be regarded as proportionate? And, um, I think the answer is going to be that a lot depends on whether they're used for reactive or uh, preventive uh, uh, policing. Um, e even for the sake of preventive policing, we can say that special investigative techniques might be preferable to the cultivation of a huge network of informants from a big civil society population. Um, one doesn't want to have hundreds of thousands of, of uh, ordinary citizens being paid self-conscious informants for a state security police, for example, and that might be one alternative uh, to the idea of one-off uh, uses of special investigative techniques with the permission of judges or high-ranking uh, police uh, forces. But it's going to be clear on anyone's view that special investigative techniques shouldn't be used rut routinely. That's why they're called special and that's why the legal um, uh, requirements for getting for using them always involve special permission. However, uh, special investigative techniques do seem more justified uh, under the conditions given in the last uh, few bullet points on the slide. The more serious the crime being contemplated, the more the more uh, it might be justifiable to use these techniques, and the more uh, imminent it is. Uh, the more uh, justified special uh, in investigation techniques might be. A further um, uh, condition is that the more forensically aware the suspects are, the more justified it might be, and I'll come back to that. So, in order to get at the uh, forensically aware suspect, we have to distinguish that kind of suspect from the harmless citizen. <clears throat> the harmless citizen, I think, is the kind of citizen that is supposed to be protected by human rights and that is supposed to be protected by the application of proportionality tests uh, to um, different kinds of counterterrorism. The harmless citizen, then, is somebody who's uh, a kind of unwitting suspect. He's not conscious of being a suspect. He's relatively defenseless. Um, he doesn't mean any harm. And for those reasons alone, um, his being the subject of um, surveillance is an improper intrusion. Because he's innocent, surveillance is an improper intrusion. And <clears throat> the problem is that proportionality doesn't distinguish between the innocent person and the sophisticated criminal very often. Rather, uh, the sophisticated criminal is treated as if he were an innocent citizen when often there's a lot of evidence that he's not. Um, so the human rights default position, the, uh, the position of people who use the proportionality test in a pointed way, is that state power against an individual, even a criminal, is suspect. Well, <clears throat> I think um, uh, I want to question um, the uh, human rights default position because I think it fails to be discriminating enough. It fails uh, to distinguish um, the ordinary harmless citizen from the forensically aware. <clears throat> and I think uh, that, that um, uh, in the case of the forensically aware, we have the following characteristics. These are people who are, are conscious that they might be under surveillance. Uh, they're conscious that they might be subject to infiltration in their groups. They resort to coded language in, in conversation. Uh, they conceal their movements, and they conceal uh, important transactions. What's more, they exploit the legal protections afforded to innocent citizens in order to commit crime. These give reasons why special investigative techniques might be appropriately uh, used against these people. So, <clears throat> I think what I want to conclude is, 
that uh, special investigative techniques ought to be used, if at all, um, against the forensically aware, and that the forensically aware can't be viewed on the model of a harmless citizen, and that human rights uh, uh, tends to demand, I think questionably, uh, that, uh, well, human rights tends to demand that other things being equal, everyone be treated as a harmless citizen, um, but in the case of the forensically aware, uh, one has a violation of that requirement, perhaps, but it's not a violation that, that uh, you know, human uh, rights uh, tends, I think, to uh, uh, acknowledge in its recommendations for practice. Okay, so I'm going to now just revive uh, what proportionality is again. Um, it's uh, pursuing uh, worthwhile means. It's uh, pursuing a worthwhile end, but by means that pass certain tests. So those means have to be necessary, effective, and where there's a range of them, the least intrusive, the least human rights violating has to be used. <clears throat> Now I want to call attention to, to the great difficulties in applying this test in practice. Many counterterrorism measures are arguably neither necessary nor effective, <clears throat> uh, such as removing all litter bins. Although removing all litter bins uh, uh, means that uh, bombs can't be hidden in litter bins, it's not clear whether um, removing litter bins actually prevents um, bombings. Um, so it's not clear whether they, 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 uh, uh, this measure should be taken or not, but it's routinely taken in uh, city centres in the UK, uh, for example. On the other hand, this is not a measure that would attract criticism from human rights uh, people because removing litter bins is, doesn't harm anybody and doesn't uh, infringe anybody's rights. <clears throat> Another point is that effectiveness and necessity are harder to establish in preventive counterterrorism against the forensically aware. So, for people who are forensically aware and who um, who are are in, involved in criminal gangs, it's not clear what will be effective against them, and therefore it's not clear whether um, implementing that will be necessary. Um, so, if you ask yourself the question, uh, is a wiretap on someone who who's involved in a criminal gang necessary um, and effective, it's very, very difficult to give those, uh, those answers uh, because a forensically aware uh, person will be someone who is armed against these measures and, and so undermines their effectiveness. Um, here are some other uh, difficulties with applying proportionality. Um, effectiveness can have costs that call into question necessity. So, for example, searching everybody at airports is effective in keeping uh, people with dangerous weapons from getting onto airplanes. Um, it's effective in that respect, but it has great costs. Um, it's very expensive, it's very disruptive, and it's, uh, and it's fairly indiscriminate. It means that everyone who travels on, on an airplane is treated in the same way as uh, terrorists should be treated. So the question of whether it's necessary uh, to, to search everybody at airports is a live question within the security community and a live question uh, in the border guarding uh, community. Um, here are some general points. There's always a tension in preventive policing uh, against forensically aware subjects between being effective and doing the least intrusive thing. It might be thought that to be effective with forensically aware people, that is, people who are often on their guard, one has to do the more intrusive thing, so that anything that's done against the uh, forensically aware will always violate the subsidiarity principle. It's very likely to happen. You know, on, on some exceptional occasions, there's a need to do, uh, the need to do something exceeds the need to do something effective or something effectively and minimal, some, something effective and minimally intrusive. I'm going to illustrate, um, I'm going to illustrate a case that particularly shows how um, proportionality um, is difficult to apply. Uh, this is a case um, of a news report, um, a news report that was received, or a, an intelligence report that was received in the run-up to the 10th anniversary of 9-11, um, 
And, and this is uh, typical of the kind of intelligence that's often received about counter-terrorism. Counter um, uh, um, so it says, recent intelligence obtained within the past day and originating from the tribal areas of Pakistan advised the United States of a plan to set off a car or truck bombs in Washington or New York around the time of the 9-11 anniversary. Uh, that's a, 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 an actual uh, piece of intelligence that was taken seriously um, at, the, at the time of 9-11. And it's actually confirmed after the raid on bin Laden and his um, assassination that um, uh, Al-Qaeda was planning um, attacks um, to mark the anniversary of 9-11. Now, uh, the question I want to raise is, even if there was just vague intelligence of the kind that we, we've just been uh, uh, looking at, um, on the anniversary of 9-11, the significance of the anniversary of 9-11 of, of was so great that uh, the, the, that the, um, the commission of a terrorist act on that anniversary would have had tremendous propaganda value for an extremist group and also very large dispiriting effects, I think, on a group of people who were, um, namely most of New York, who was um, trying to celebrate uh, getting over 9-11. So, in my opinion, there was a particular reason for taking the measures that the New York police did take in the light of this intelligence that's to say, there was an almost total clampdown on traffic uh, coming into uh, Manhattan and it, very, very extensive and disruptive uh, checks on all cars and trucks that might be uh, carrying this kind of bomb. Now, um, somebody could say uh, that this, uh, the measures the police took um, didn't satisfy any of the uh, um, any of the conditions that proportionality involves uh, because uh, the, uh, the, those police measures on all the cars and trucks were not likely to be effective with such um, bad intelligence, such vague intelligence that measure was really just a total fishing expedition was very unlikely to, to um, identify anybody who was uh, going to, to, to bomb anywhere and because it was, it was uh, not likely to be effective, it wouldn't count as a necessary measure. Um, uh, though not many people were arrested in this operation, many people could have been, so they would have been deprived of their freedom, and then the subsidiarity uh, condition would have been engaged. But even so, it seems to me that even if the subsidiarity condition had been engaged in this kind of a, of, of a case, it was unthinkable uh, to do nothing um, uh, in the face of this intelligence. It was necessary to do something, even if that something was ineffective. And, and that shows, it seems to me, that the legal concept of proportionality uh, is sometimes fails of application, but there's a perfectly good sense um, of appropriateness or proportionality that's familiar in philosophical discussions of justice um, that I think justify the conclusion that something had to be done even though all of the available things that could be done were not likely to be effective. Within the literature, within the literature on, on proportionality itself, there has begun to be an acknowledgement that sometimes the need to do something for the, for, for, from the point of view of making a gesture to the population, even a theatrical gesture, can be of great value. And uh, I think that goes against the spirit of proportionality, but I think it's, it's, it's uh, something that's true. Um, uh, sometimes it's necessary to do something, even if this something is, um, is not going to pass the proportionality test, even if it's not going to be effective, and even if it's not going to be necessary. And one needs to come up with a theory about the appropriateness of such a measure. That theory, will, I think, um, help us to uh, get away from the um, mechanical implication of proportionality um, as a test of measures in counterterrorism.